All right. Good afternoon. I'm Erin Robinson, Director of Outreach and Strategic Campaigns at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Unpacking the Harms Behind Georgia's Latest Court Fines and Fees Data. Today, you'll hear from GBPI's Senior Analyst for Workforce Justice and Criminal Legal Systems, who has done some incredible work over the past few months building a dashboard to help Georgians explore reliance on fines and fees. Ray Calfani will share background on the issue of fines and fees, share recent data findings and what this can mean for Georgians, and give an overview of our new data dashboard. Ray's presentation will be followed by a Q&A, so we welcome you to share your questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I'll turn it over to Ray to get us started. Thank you so much, Aaron. I appreciate that. And just want to acknowledge for you know all those who are attending and even those who could listen to this, watch this, you know, after this is after this is over and, and just want to see how things went, you know, at some point down the road. Um, just want to acknowledge, you know, the folks who could be, you know, those who have lived experience, those who are advocates, those who are researchers, those who just have general interest about the issues around fines and fees, how they impact people. Or even just, you know, there, there may just be some people who are just a mix of all of that. So just want to acknowledge everyone um, who's, who's attending or who will watch this in a future time. Uh, I'll go into my next slide and we can get started. So when I say the general phrase, you know, fines and fees, what I mean by that um, is court fines and fees. You know, they're, they're, now granted, I acknowledge there are a lot of different um, fines and fees that people can experience within the criminal legal system. You know, those could be uh, jail fines and fees or just pay to stay fees. Um, that can be um, incarceration related fines and fees, particularly when you think about uh, prison communication fines and fees. There can be bail fees that people have to pay. Um, there can even be, think about, you know, par parole fines and fees. That are that are part of all this, but for this specific for this particular discussion, today is around court fines and fees and things that are um, you know pretty pretty close or pretty adjacent uh, to to what to what takes place and all the dynamics around court fines and fees issues in our state. So going into the next slide and getting into you know what I mean when I say court fines and fees and how people can how a person can experience this. Um, because I want people to, to see this, how, how this looks like, on, on what, it look, what it looks like on the ground and how we think about fines and fees issues more broadly. But starting on the ground, you know, when a person who experiences issues or where they can be in a community that that relies on a, an excessive use of court fines and fees, that can start from someone who gets a citation from you know police or from code enforcement. It could be a financial penalty that gets added uh, by a judge if they have to go to court over you know a minor offense like a traffic ticket it could be from tickets from automated traffic cameras from a automated speeding camera or a red light camera and you know these types of issues these these types of fines or fees and how they start um have disproportionate harms that those who are at or below the economic margins uh feel more than anyone else um in terms of you know it starts from someone who may not be able to pay um, you know, the, the fines and fees that are assessed to them up front and have to deal with all the consequences that can come afterwards. Um, there's the the risk that happen, you know, when someone who was, you know, in a, in a city or a county or area that has excessive reliance on fines and fees or excessive use of, you know, there's, there's risk in terms of, you know, there could be, there, there's a risk in community distrust that comes from this excessive contact with law enforcement in terms of the likely, you know, the uh, higher likelihood of, um, a pretextual stop, um, higher likelihood of police violence that can happen um, from that. And then, you know, there could be this potential gateway for criminalization and incarceration that could come for those who, that, that, that can all start from someone not being able to uh, pay court fines and fees that can come from one of those sources up front. So I'll go to the next slide. Um, so now just trying to go take it a little more broadly when we think about how people experience um, places that have excessive uses of fines and fees. Again, you know, this is this can come from you know, a higher likelihood of experiencing, you know, aggressive law enforcement that's acting on quotas that can be formal or informal from their local community that says they need to, you know, 
gather as much fine and thief revenue as possible by giving out citations and making pretextual stops. Um, it can also come, it can happen, it can, people can experience it in different ways in different places, such as some, some cities or counties may heavily rely on excessive fines and fees in terms of traffic tickets they give out to out of town drivers, you know, in terms of when you think about a place like Lenox, Georgia, uh, which relies on this out of town driver across just one highway that goes through where, you know, people coming from, going from Georgia to Florida or Florida back to Georgia or, or just, you know, those just commuting state to state um, are, are those who are most likely to get traffic tickets, you know, in, in that area. Or it could come from traffic tickets from those who are uh, on, on in-town residents or, or citations to go to folks who are in-town residents. I mean, we think back to Ferguson, Missouri, uh, where in 2014, Michael Brown was tra tragically killed and Department of Justice had a very comprehensive report on the fines and fees, practices of excessive use of that. Um, in Ferguson, where Ferguson was relying on revenue that came relying on fines and fines and fees revenue that came from what they from citations of in town residents or Ferguson residents, and it could also look like like it looking like like Doraville, Georgia, Doraville, Doraville, Georgia, um, has relied on uh the disproportionate revenue that they get from um a number of Hispanic residents who live there and other migrant um. Uh, families that live there through local ordinance violations that um, say that you can't park your car on a side of a street in a residential area. And for a number of Hispanic um, families in, in our state, you know, they, they are, they're self-employed, meaning that they, they, many of them could have vans or trucks that where they hold all of their work equipment. And, you know, some may not be able, you know, just because of their, you know, family dynamic or other dynamics may not always be able to park their car in a driveway so they're parking on the side of a street of a residential street, and they could be disproportionately harmed and fined and have to deal with consequences that could come from that um, if, they're unable, if they're not able to pay those, those, those fines and fees um, sanctions up front. And then you know, it also, when we think about how people that can experience you know, these type of excessive uses in local communities, we think about local courts. And when you know, if someone can't pay their fine and fee up front or before court, and they have to go to court because of some type of you know, minor offense, um, you know, they could be less likely to be given due process in terms of courts, you know, speedily going through cases without them having a chance to really argue their case, having, you know, little to no access to a public defender on an issue, um, not knowing whether or not they are being placed on probation for an inability to pay fines and fees up front. And because in Georgia, you certainly can, you can be criminalized, criminalized by being placed on probation for not being able to pay court fines and fees up front or beforehand. Um, and even for those who know that they could be placed on probation, they may not even be told all of the total costs that can come with being placed on probation. Um, so there are a number of things that just don't give them, you know, the due process that they should receive going through a court that could be part of a community that has excessive reliance on fines and fees. And then just going a little bit more broadly, when we think about these type of communities, oftentimes they are those who have, you know, city councils or county commissions that are planning for excessive fine and fee revenue in their budgets before their, before their budgets drop. Um, and then even thinking even more broadly than that, when we think about, um, you know, the type the, the communities that, or are, are, are likely to um, excessively rely on fines and fees, it can start when we think about just revenue sources that come to them. When we think about this from a federal, state, federal and state revenue and how that can, can trickle down to local governments in terms of how they fund local governments. When we lose revenue in terms of federal tax revenue sources, as we've lost, and as research has shown, you know, when we think about the Trump tax cuts, also known as the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, you know, that has had implications that trickled all the way down to local governments in terms of the revenue that's available to them, making many more governments, local governments, um, more likely to excessively rely on fines and fees. And then when you think about even state revenue and how that um, can trickle down to local governments. You know, Georgia is a state that is already taking steps to reduce its state income tax and the state revenue that comes from that, or uh, well, the law state revenue that can come from that can certainly have harmful impacts on local government, on, on local governments who may turn um, to, to more excessive fine and fee reliance as a result. So I'll go to the next slide. And now I'm going to go into the, the, just some highlights from, from the data from the, from the dashboard that um, that is, you know, part of all this, that's the, that's the foundation of today's conversation. 
to talk about just what these data points mean. So going right on into the next slide, um, and I'll just start with 2022 in terms of 2022 highlights that I found just in, in my analysis that's visualized on our dash in, in the dashboard and the fines and fees fact sheet that, that, that it's embedded in. Um, in 2022, there were 86 cities and counties that relied on court fines and fees to fund at least 10% of their public services. And 10%, that is, you know, national research has found that 10%, that's the threshold in which uh, a, a local government has excessive reliance on fines and fees. And the way that excessive reliance looks is what I talked about in the beginning. When you think of, you know, lack of due process, when you think about a higher likelihood of aggressive uh, traffic stops and pretextual stops, uh, you know, when you when you think about um, the planning of budgets, you know, long beforehand in terms of planning for this type of excessive revenue, that's what that 10 percent threshold signifies. Um, so 86 cities and counties met that threshold and certainly have those situations or, or a mix of them um, that, that happens that, that people feel in terms of the harm and the over reliance on fines and fees. And, and within that, the eight, those 86 cities and counties. Um, there are 23 of them in 2022 that relied on fines and fees for at least 20 percent and had black populations that were above the state average. And this is, you know, goes into a, sim a, a, a similarity when we just think about Ferguson and think about, you know, Georgia can, it likely has at least 23 Fergusons in terms of like the excessive reliance on fines and fees when you also have, you know, black populations that are much higher um, than the state average. And then within you know these 86 cities and counties, we also have 12 cities that relied on fines and fees to cover more than 40% of their budget. We know a number of them. Uh, if you know, for those who cover this issue and, and look at Georgia, you know, whether that's a Lenox, Georgia, that's one city that's like that. A Rocky Ford, Georgia is another city that's that's well above 40%. Um, Warwick, Georgia, another city that that's that's the same. Um, you know. There are a number of cities that have very, very high levels of reliance that go all the way up to, you know, you know relying on finding the fees to cover 79% of their budget um, in 2022. And then the last stat for 2022, you know, just when you think about just revenue, just sheer revenue, not necessarily the the, the share that finds the fees make up of someone's budget, but just the, the sheer revenue numbers. So we look at all revenue generated, um, all fines and fees that revenue that was generated in 2022. 44% of it, that's nearly half, was generated in communities with above average black populations and which had poverty rates that doubled the state average. So I'll go to the next slide, where we'll talk about just trend lines from, from a, a seven year trend line from 2016 all the way up to 2022. And right now, 2022 is um, uh, you know, the, the latest data that we were able to analyze and put in this. Um, but, you know, one, you know, when we think about just, um, how how it's trended down, you know, from 2016 to 2022, there's been a 20 27 percent decline, and that is largely because of what took place in 2020, where there was a you know statewide judicial order to slow most court functions, which in turn slowed down um you know the 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 number of cities that relied on fines and fees revenue because their courts weren't operating um at at 100 percent, and you know. You know, we, we certainly expect, you know, a number of cities to be decline back to pre-pandemic levels um, as their courts begin to, to work through the backlogs that some courts still experience. Uh, so going into the next slide and think about other, you know, more trends that take place. And once again, I'm going to go into just thinking about sheer revenue, not the not the share of total, um, not the share of budgets that finds a fees revenue makes up, but just fines and fees, revenue amounts in general, in total. So when we think about, um, I, I talked about this point before about, you know, cities with higher than average poverty and higher than average black populations are consistently generating a disproportionate share of statewide fines and fees revenue. And just going for 2016, where 29% of cities accounted for 51% of revenue, and by 2022, 26% of cities accounted for 44% of revenue. These are very, very ugly, disproportionate numbers. And even if you take out the city of Atlanta, which of course makes up a huge chunk, you know, it's a you know very big city, a lot of people, all of that. So has a, a great deal of revenue that makes up these totals. Even when you take out the city of Atlanta and its revenue totals in this, there is still disproportionate reliance when you think of dis disproportionate revenue generated. Uh, when you think about all of the remaining cities, 
that have higher than average black populations and higher than average overall poverty. So I'll go to the next slide. And when we think about just th this, this same um, issue of just sheer, sheer, you know, revenue numbers, um, and you look at all cities and and their re their their revenue trends from 2016 to 2022, fines and fees revenue across all cities in Georgia grew by five percent. But when you compare that to the cities that were in the top ten in poverty rates and black population shares and how their fines and fees revenue grew, it grew by sixty four percent. So you know that's a very striking number that tells you know a really striking stat about how you know the places that find that these revenue is, revenues are being generated but also driving the other point in that you know some of these cities are not cities that have very high um shares of the fines and fees that make up their budgets but even still it does just because a city and this is just another just strong point to make and understand that just because a city doesn't have um high shares of fines and fees revenue that make up their budgets People who are at or below the economic margins can still fall into into traps, um, in a sense, because of the type of fines and fees practices that they have. And we'll certainly get a little bit more in that as we continue. So I'll go into the next slide, and, and now just talk about um, just more broadly how these type of fines and fees, excessive reliance issues, overlap with other issues that 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 are you know very important in this state. And then going into the next slide, I'll first just talk about, um, and I kind of given a preview into it already about how court fines and fees issues um, certainly, you know, are adjacent to probation and incarceration issues that we have in our state. You know, Georgia is one of has the fourth highest incarceration rate in our state, and in, in the nation. I'm sorry, has and has the number one probation rate by far um, of all states in the country, and the and the private probation practices that, that Georgia allows certainly are a big driver of that. Um, so, you know, when though and, and again, you know, when 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 Georgians who have low incomes, you know, when they, you know, they face this disproportionate harm because um if, you know, they're in a they're in a, a city or a county or encounter a court that contracts with a private probation company and they can't pay their fines and fees up front, they're put under they're they're you know given a misdemeanor, they're placed on private probation supervision which comes with a lot of financial and even hidden costs that make it very hard to, 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 to pay their fines and fees off in any kind of, you know, reasonable time. Um, and it can even, you know, put them in spaces where it makes it very difficult for them to remain compliant because of so many hidden costs, along with the massive financial costs that happen where someone can ultimately be in a space where someone who, um, you know, is at or below the economic margins, they can ultimately end up paying two, three times, or just exponentially more um, money than someone who of means uh, would be paying for the same offense, but just someone of means could have paid their court fines and fees off either before court or during court and go on with their lives and not be placed under proper probation, which has so many spiraling consequences. So, you know, when we think about proper probation in our state and how it, um, it is, just overlaps with the issues of, of of excessive fines and fees, reliance, or even places that don't, aren't excessive because people can still fall into traps if they don't pay, if they're not able to pay fines and fees up front. You know, we got we must think about how private probation in this state um, for those who are placed on it because they simply because they could not afford to pay fines and fees up front. Or just even, you know, even if, you know, if there's other offenses someone could be placed on in terms of, of, of private probation, if someone who is at or below those margins doesn't have the means to be able to make timely payments and and handle all of the cumbersome compliance that comes with that, um, you know, they could have a gate, there, there could be a gateway to incarceration. It also has heavy costs to the public when we're thinking about how the public, you know, how, how you know, everyone um it is paying for incarceration costs you know jail costs and, and dealing with all the things that happen when we have um overcrowded jails you know we hear so many stories about so many harms deaths that take place in overcrowded jails in in the city of Atlanta but this is also something that takes place even when you think of in a number of other places even when you think about Augusta Augusta has has dealt with particularly in Richmond County their jails have had been overcrowded um, for quite a long time in Richmond County and, and Augusta um, can be said to be the epicenter of private probation harms in our state. So I'll go to the next slide and think of, as we talk about other issues that overlap 
uh, with with the excessive use of fines and fees and just just the harms of of of, of um you know inequitable uses of of, of fines in, in general. Um, when we think about Georgia workers and you know those earning low incomes, you know they face these disproportionate harms of falling into these type of revenue traps. You know, they're the ones that are most likely to be unable to pay up front, you know, putting them at, at risk to be placed on on probation or private probation. You know, they're more likely to have the type of economic circumstances that make it um, very difficult, if not impossible, to afford basic necessities, as well as maintain compliance with very cumbersome probation terms that are more um, you know, focused on profits than any type of rehabilitation. Um, or anything in, in terms of like giving relief to those who are having troubles making um, payments to private probation companies. And also even those who are granted community service um, as, as a substitute for some of the fines and fees debts that they may have, community service can be a double-edged sword in this state in terms of uh, the hidden costs that are often associated with having a job that, you know, is likely if you're someone who's earning, you know, a, a low wage, you know, that job is likely very unflexible. It's very difficult um, to be able to balance doing community service and maintaining employment, you know, along with the fact that doing community service is probably taking you away from dollars that you can be earning on your job. Um, the transportation issues as far as getting back and forth. And then even just when you think about the value of community service in this state, um, you know, it's it's valued, you know, the, the federal minimum wage was a seven twenty five an hour because Georgia has refused so far to raise the minimum wage floor so that more people can have, uh, you know, a better access to a livable wage. Um, you know, people's people's labor while they are having to, um, you know, be under probation or pay fines and fees that their, their labor is undervalued, making them be on probation. Um, or on payment plans um, much longer um, than what they would be if if we had a higher uh, wage floor. So I'll go to the next slide. And, and now just talking about just the, the, the context, you know, in our legislature around court fines and fees issues, you know, one thing that is over the last, particularly the last, you know, two or three years that, you know, hasn't gotten very much um, spotlight um, is the, 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 the added, um, Courts adding uh, courts technology fees um, across the state. Just a number of courts, as far as legislative bills that go through, uh, where courts are adding these court technology, or local governments are adding court technology fees to various local courts. Um, and these technology fees come um, and come in with the, they can make you know just court fines and fees in general that much more difficult to pay for those for those who are um, you know below economic means. Um, and they come where, you know, it doesn't matter someone's situation. It doesn't matter the context of their case. It doesn't matter their circumstance. You know, they have to pay this these higher prices, these higher amounts to be able to, you know, to pay off all of the fine and fee debt that they have, which just raises the likelihood that more people uh, who encounter these courts are going to be in spaces where they can't pay fines and fees up front. And they're going to have to face the consequences that come after that are consequences that are simply criminalizing their inability to pay. Um, and then we also think about other issues that are adjacent to, to court fines and fees issues, um, you know, automatic traffic enforcement expansion, particularly in school zones in this state. You know, the, their, you know, HB 348 was a, was a bill that came in our last legislative session. It did not pass, but certainly has gotten, you know, a lot of uh, um, uh, you know, movement, attention and, and support that we hopefully can can at least change or make people think about um, the issue of school safety um, just in a more comprehensive way, because I certainly acknowledge that, you know, this bill, which seeks, seeks to address this bill and bills like it, that seek to address a very serious issue of public safety, you know, particularly, you know, in schools as, as, as kids go in and out of school, you know, we must also think about, you know, the, the road infrastructure component of this. Um, and as well as thinking, of, you know, carefully thinking about making sure that, you know, Thinking about the issue of do we want to have just more pile on layered issues when we think about um, you know fines and fees and the consequences that come, particularly from all the things that I just laid out, you know we must just carefully think about you know how we address public safety without be putting people in spaces, particularly those who are um, you know at or below the economic margins, and more spaces where they are likely to have a gateway to incarceration and other consequences. 
Um, and then also um, the, the last thing around this, you know, it happened in 2020 where there was an attempt to expand um, the, the profiteering of our, our private probation system. It happened, you know, HB 1040 came before um, the pandemic began in 2020. And, you know, when that came in, it certainly changed the course of what was taking place in the legislature and the things that were um, uh, prioritized. But this is certainly, you know, a, a, another just dangerous um, you know, harmful, you know, bill attempt to be able to expand the harms that proper probation um, can bring to people, which, you know, we, we see in just so many places across our, across our state, you know, and we see it, you know, more than anything else in, in our probation rate, which is higher, which is just drastically higher than any other state in the country. So now I'll, I'll transition and go to the next slide. And, you know, as I mentioned, I, I know there's, you know, there, there could be you know, different folks on this on, on this webinar today who have, you know, different interests. And, you know, some, you know, there may be some researchers on, on this webinar who, who have fi local fines and fees data and, and are trying to get, you know, to the place where they can begin to visualize their own, whether that's in a static map or an interactive map, which is the one that I put together in this, in this latest dashboard that we have. Uh, so, you know, just this here is just providing it's just a couple of links that can help to kind of bridge that, that 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 data gap that can help folks get on that path to be able to have their own interactive or static visualizations that can map out fines and fees data that, that they have access to in their state. So I'll go to the next slide and just, you know, this is just a couple of links um, to to some helpful YouTube tutorials that have been very helpful to me, you know, along my, my data and my, my data journey. Um, this this map here is a map from my 2022 report, which is a static map that I created in R. Um, and there's just a couple of links there that you know were very helpful to me in being able to bring this to life. And then just going to the next slide, um, uh, the last slide, just in terms of you know my my, my latest uh, data project as far as the dashboard, and this is just a, a snapshot of you know of one of the um, the uh, interactive maps that are here. And of course I use Tableau for this, but even to prep the data to put in a Tableau, um, I used um, an R function called Tidy Excel that helped me to, to parse through a huge, huge um, Excel spreadsheet, at least a couple of huge Excel spreadsheets that had you know hundreds and hundreds of data on cities um, and counties and allow me to parse through that to make a much more manageable spreadsheet that I can then place in a tableau. So, you know, these links here could be helpful for that. I hope they can be helpful for someone on the call who's looking to bridge that, that data gap and, and use some of the data they have to be able to, 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 to visualize and show some of the stories they have on fines and fees issues across their state. So I will stop there. I'll go to the next slide just to um, start for questions and, and I'll just turn it back to Aaron first. Um, to, to bring us into our Q&A portion. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ray. So you actually ended talking about some of the data. So I think that's a great roll in to our next, to our first question. Um, can you talk about how difficult was it to actually get this data to build this dashboard and what challenges did you encounter and how did you overcome those? Yes, yes. I mean, certainly, I mean, I think when any researcher, I mean, it starts with, you know, looking at previous research, looking at, you know, other people who have done this work, their methodologies from a state and national front um, to be able to find out where to look. And then, you know, from there, I found that, you know, Georgia Department of Community Affairs, you know, they have, uh, you know, local finance data that they collect um, that's accessible to the public. And then so that was one part of it. Um, and then also just to be able to do analysis, you know, that, that, that shows the, the racial and, um, you know, ethnic breakdowns, population breakdowns um, across different cities and, cities and counties. I had to um, reconcile um, find local finance data with census data um, across city and county and put all that together in a bunch of, you know, complex data steps to make, to also make what we have here. So, yeah, it was quite, you know, pretty, pretty cumbersome to do that. Um, you know, it took a little bit of time for, to be able to learn that and, and, and properly execute it. But um, this, you know, one of my biggest um, uh, projects, babies, you know, <laughs> uh, data, you know, data babies that you know I, I've created here. So I'm just incredibly proud. But yeah, it was certainly a, a, a process. Thank you. So you shared a, a lot about context on the issue. Um, and I know you put out a fact sheet about this. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the recommendations that you put forward? Yes, yes. So um, certainly, I mean, when we think, just think about 
this in terms of revenue. Um, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, when other revenue sources at the state level, you know, and we'll, I'll just stay on the state level when we think about policy recommendations, you know, we have other proactive data sources, particularly when we just think about our state income tax. When, when we reduce our state income tax, that has implications that could fall into, um, you know, the, the way that, you know, local governments rely on fines and fees, because oftentimes, you know, when revenue sources from from the state or from the feds dry up, or, or at least you know when when, when they decrease, you know, local governments you know can be more likely to turn to fines and fees revenue, you know, to backfill that that lost data. Um, and also just when we think about um, you know, the fact that you know I I, I started talking a lot more about cities than I did counties because in Georgia, you know, our state doesn't fund um city courts or municipal courts. Um, county courts or county level courts, uh, they they get you know a, a, they get more funding. They get some funding, at least you know, compared to zero from for, for municipal courts. So when we're not investing in our courts and we're just at, we're, we're telling them, hey, you know, you've got to go get your own revenue. You know, when you put that and you know, when you combine that with situations where you know there you know local areas, local communities that um, don't have um, other solid, you know, sources of proactive revenue. When we think about property, maybe property tax revenues, um, as I, I know that's you know can be quite complicated. Uh, but when there when there aren't when there is an absence of other proactive revenue sources, we can see these type of issues in terms of these excessive uses of fines and fees revenue to be able to backfill budget. So we must think about how we can have this more proactive revenue sources, so we're not relying on revenue sources that are. Um, um, relying on criminalization to be able to fill our blanks. Thank you, Ray. And I think you might have answered part of our next question, but I'll ask it just in case there's anything else you want to add. Um, we got a question about, um, can you talk about why cities may have turned to private probation? But I feel like you kind of leaned into it, but I'll see if you have anything else you want to add there. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I know I, I talked about, you know, I just gave a recommendation in terms of something that can hopefully prevent more cities or, or, or may have fewer cities turning to just court fines and fees revenue in general. But then the adjacent thing to that is private probation. So when you think about why a number of cities in our state have turned to private probation, it's one because, you know, um, you know, municipal courts, city courts, they get no revenue from the state um, and, and they're forced to have to go find that revenue in other places. And, They've turned to private probation companies, which the state has allowed them to do, to say, okay, I've, you know, charged someone, I've, I've assessed someone with, you know, a certain amount of court fines and fees. I don't have the the, the court staff or the, you know, the, the financial, you know, resources, the funding to be able to, to support that type of, you know, those that those collection efforts. So I want a private probation company company to do that for me. And, you know, the agreement there is, you know, private probation companies don't charge municipal courts or county courts. I mean, they, they, they don't they don't charge courts for their services. They're allowed to charge people who, who are under their supervision um, to be able to make their profits. So, you know, courts turn to private probation companies, you know, as a as a as you know, an attempt or a way to save costs, you know, for their their local government, um, as well as in a way to try to to maximize um, the court fines and fees revenue that they're looking to collect because a private probation company can collect that court fine and fee revenue that they assess to people um, and they'll do it at no charge to those courts. But, the, uh, but you know, the thing that is not considered or certainly not considered enough are the other costs, the other public costs that that creates. Um, you know, often, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, those who are, you know, who fall under, you know, private probation, there are folks who on there simply because they could not pay their fines and fees up front. And there are others who were there, um, you know, not, not just because they couldn't pay by fines and fees up front, but just, you know, they could be placed on, you know, probation for, you know, a minor offense, but they also could still be folks who, you know, are at or below the economic margins, have very difficult times um, being able to make the payments to pay, to pay um, private probation companies along with all the, uh, all the fines and fees that, that are being charged that are well above, their initial cost when they go to court. Um, and, you know, and that certainly can have, you know, just a, a, a number of harms that they can lead to incarceration and all the costs associated with incarceration, those costs are having to be borne by local, 
you know, local governments, as well as all just the human costs that happen when you have, you know, local jails that overflow, that fill up and, and all the, you know, the harm, the, the potential loss of life, um, you know, all the health risks that happen when you have jails that are overcrowded and people, there's, there's a, a good share of those people who are in those jails coming, to, you know, being placed there because of an issue that ultimately was a foundation for them not be, be, being able to pay fines and fees, you know, while they run the probation. So um, we got a comment and question around ARPA funds. So um, someone said, I also wonder how the infusion of ARPA funds and other federal COVID money affected the city's reliance on fines and fees. I've heard prosecutors say they schedule special probation court sessions for after tax returns come in. So is it that the cities have more, more money coming in so they don't go after fines and fees as aggressively, or they know some folks might be receiving money and they're trying to collect fines and fees more aggressively? Have you seen any connections there or heard any conversations around that? Well, I mean, I think, you know, um, people who can be under supervision from a private probation company, you know, the private probation company, which has a lot of leverage in courts because they have they're, they're, they're given judicial power as well. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, they will take whatever money they can get um, from a person if, if a person's getting any type of relief. Now, I know we just talk about ARPA funds, so that's not some funds that go to individuals. Those are funds that go to, you know, protect governments and some local governments may have used those funds in ways that have that, that did decrease their reliance on. Uh, court fines and fees. So that is certainly a possibility. I think it, it really just comes down to, you know, the, you know, you know, each local government and how they want to use, you know, ARPA fees and, you know, whether they want to use that in ways that can, you know, benefit their criminal legal system and all the, and everyone who was served by it, you know, whether you are, you know, you're justice impacted or not, um, you know, it, it certainly can vary. And I think it's, it's just, it's really up to local governments, you know, for them to decide, you know, whether they wanted to use, um, certain federal relief dollars to put to also, you know, spread that relief, you know, to criminal legal systems that, that that can prevent more people from falling into an ugly cycle of consequences that happen, you know, when they just can't pay things up front. I hope that answers the question. Great. Um, so we talked a little bit about some of your recommendations and what uh, cities can do. But uh, we just got a question in, if you could make the necessary changes in the upcoming legislative session, do you think there is an ideal policy or action at the state level that could solve this issue or help lessen it? Yeah, I mean, I say, I mean, there's, there's a number of things. I mean, of course, so many policy issues are so layered. I mean, when you just think about court fines and fees in general, I mean, certainly, you know, um, you know, making sure that they are, um, you know, across the board, equitable processes in um, determining people's ability to pay. Um, but and, you know, beyond that, just just it, just in a more broader sense, just making sure that um, fines and fees are proportional to someone's economic situation. Right. Because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying nothing of what I'm saying says, hey, we don't we, people should not face a penalty if they, you know, commit an offense or an infraction. The issue is that 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 penalty should be proportionate you know, to, to, to their situation. Um, and, then, and then one other thing in terms of, you know, we just should not be um, operating private probation, allowing private probation companies to operate in our state. That's that just bar none. We should not be doing that because you cannot, you know, as, as, as has been said before, you know, the phrase, you can't serve two masters in terms of you, you can't serve, serve a profit motive and a public safety motive at the same time private probation comp or, or rehabilitation, you know, more at the same time, you, you can't do that, you know, under a for-profit system. So ending the use of that and just thinking more thoughtfully about how we can have public um, probation systems for those who face, who, who have misdemeanor offenses, because that's what I'm talking about here, not felony offenses, that's a whole new topic. But for misdemeanor offenses, think about how we can have thoughtful, careful um, um, systems that supervise people and give people exit ramps meaningful, equitable exit ramps from probation and other ways, even as we think about things that are adjacent to our criminal legal system, because, you know, criminal legal system issues are not just about laws that, you know, you know, 
um, judicial laws or law enforcement related laws. There are laws about all the other issues that that bleed into this, that that create, that contribute to a gateway into issues of probation um, and and other consequences of court fines and fees. You know, if we if we you know allow more people to have livable you know, livable wages, you know more at, you know more access to economic security and all the ways that that means, that means there are fewer on ramps to you know, all forms of criminal legal system entanglement with, you know, that that all pretty much have fines and fees wrapped up in them. So, you know, we, we certainly must think holistically about that as far as thinking about on-ramps and, and reducing those on-ramps of this, um, making sure that people have equitable off-ramps um, when, when it comes to entanglement with courts and, and probation, and also just ensuring that people have just more access to economic security in all the ways that can help people to um, you know, to live better lives that 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 stay away from you know the entanglement of our criminal legal system. Great, thank you. Um, and to wrap us up, what would you say you want the takeaway from today's conversation to be? That people, if people are talking about this issue with others, or what is the thing that you would want them to know? Yeah, I mean, I, I've said it kind of you know throughout you know this you know today's discussion is that you know when we think about reducing revenue sources. We must be mindful of the fact that that is very often, um, what comes after that very often is a is an increase in relying on fines and fees as a revenue source. Um, and that there is something that has so many harms um, and is so counterproductive in so many things that we think about, um, so many policies that we think about. So a reduction in, in revenue, state, federal, um, even you know, you know, local revenues um, can have you know a very harmful impact that can lead to more local governments turning their fines and fees to backfill their budgets. So be mindful of that every time we're having a revenue conversation, because you know, if if we're talking about reducing revenues, are we also talking about increasing fines and fees revenues, which have so many harms to Georgia and across our state? Great, thank you so much, Ray. That concludes our webinar today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to talking more about fines and fees in the future. And if you're interested, you can find Ray's, Ray's brief on gbpi.org. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a good rest of your day.